Hello to everybody. Welcome to ETF on the screen. Today, our guest is the Serbian author Vladimir Pistola. Together with Shebna Mishikuze, they will have a nice conversation. Thank you very much for being us, for spending the hours with us. I'm uh, sure if you're watching this program, you will uh, know about Tesla. You will know about his life. It's very interesting. And somebody put his life, in fact, in a novel, Vladimir Pistola. Thank you very much for joining us. Shebnam Ishiguzal. Everybody in Turkey, I guess, knows her. She started very early with her books. Only when she was 20 years old, she got an award, the Story Award, with her book, The Future Looks Bright. And later, she also wrote articles in newspapers. She has other novels and stories. In fact, I want to introduce this book, The Girl in the Tree. It was published in America also, in the States, and in many other countries. And there are other books. She also got the Dame de Sion Award with her uh, novel, Mansion of Tears. She also got another award. She also, she's also writing for children. She published some books for the children, and she also put that in her biography, and therefore I wanted to mention that. She is a mother of Tamara and Ararat. And now I want to pass the word to Shebnam. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Good evening from Istanbul. Mr. Pistalo. Yesterday, I had an electricity shortcut and I could not watch, unfortunately. And uh, there's a very well known story. It's about um, some metaphysics. And Freud uh, believes uh, that a bookshelf can tumble down. And if somebody is believing in superstition, maybe Tesla will cut the electricity again. Maybe we'll have a power cut. I would like to start with my first question. Starting with Tesla's life, you wrote a novel, a known biography, a known uh, story you put into a novel. There must have been some difficulties. What is the chemistry to turn a biography into a novel? As readers, we can see what you have gone through. But did you were you worried at the beginning? Uh, yes. First of all, I'm very glad that I'm in Istanbul, at least virtually under these circumstances. And uh, I have been writing a novel about Tesla for eight years. And I have been afraid of my character because he's a complicated man. And then everybody knew much about Tesla. So when you write about something that many people care about, then you have a special responsibility. So I was reading everything that existed written about Tesla. And part of the day I was researching and part of the day I was writing. And I guess I had to familiarize myself with Tesla in order not to be afraid of him. Because when you live eight years with your character, you could not be, you could not be afraid of the, of the way that you live your daily life and Tesla became a part of my daily life. And just to answer Shebnam's question, I started with the images. I didn't, I, I didn't go uh, uh, from one period of his life to another. For example, when he, makes, when he makes lightning, he was the only mortal, according to what I know, that made lightning. I mean, the, the, the gods of lightning, like Zeus and Perun and, uh, and Thor, they, they make lightning, but not a mortal. Lightning usually comes from the sky to the earth, and Tesla was the only one who made lightning from the earth toward the sky. So I was starting with the great mystical images like that and researching and then connecting them using that chemistry that Shebnam told, uh, mentioned to tell the story. In your novel, in the Turkish language, anybody reading your novel was very happy about it, about such a book. 
your translator Sueda Kaya translated your book into Turkish. One of the readers said, somebody put oneself in Tesla's place. You can feel like you are Tesla. This is some comment from a Turkish reader in a literature uh, website. As an author, what is your success in transforming his inner life? In order to be in Tesla's inner life, you need some information and then you need to have the feeling. How did you do that? Because it is very deep, it is very detailed. Tesla's life, inner life is very detailed, very complex, just like you said. How did you create this internal life? Only information may not be enough. How did you feel what he was feeling? I'm very glad that you are asking that because that's exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to show the inner world of my character. And we, we writers, we are a little bit like actors. We have to get into the persona of the person that we are writing about. I know when great Daniel Day-Lewis was acting Lincoln, and it was very hard for an American because Lincoln is like God. And he was trying to get Lincoln and he was talking about process. And then he said, I first heard his voice. Somehow I heard his voice in my head. And then I had to put that voice from my head into my, into my throat, into my mouth. And that process is a little bit mystical. You could not be a creator without being a mystic at all. And that's how you get actually into somebody else's uh, persona and through intuition, what else, uh, of course, facts help you, but facts are not everything. You reconstruct the person. The fiction of your novel, another question I would like to ask you. Everything in Tesla's life is left or somewhere on the road, it's half. He has a team, but he cannot complete. Your novel has short chapters, it's easy to read. It reminds me of electricity because with the little lightnings. But at the same time, it reminded me of little uh, stones to build a tower, maybe. Uh, how could you provide uh, this fiction? Did you have a special idea? Did you have some method? Did you start with the fiction or did you have other methods you could use? Uh, I, uh, that's kind of... I think an interesting combination to write a long novel with short chapters so that they are they function like stories and sometimes almost like poems and that way they make a connection with the reader and I, I did it deliberately and then it is natural to me I never kind of knew the difference between poetry and prose to me poetry and prose and even ideas and feelings were always mixed since I think that children think like that but I continue to think like that and they were in these inner flashes, you know, like I was trying to tell that, that story. And it is interesting, Ivo Andrich, you know, the, the, the guy from uh, uh, born in Bosnia, a Serbian writer who got a Nobel Prize, he said that you should always start with the detail. And connecting the details, you get the higher picture. If you start from the big story, the great narrative, it always stays paper-like. It doesn't have the depth from the inside. But if you start with the details and then you connect them into big story, then I think it works. Mm -hmm. uh, a second ago, you said thinking like children. This is interesting with the prosa because Tesla with his genius inventions has a different feeling a different soul i think he's a bit childish do you think the same way maybe a, a reader just as a reader you may think 
he let other people take away what he has. He cannot protect himself. He's believing in other people. Therefore, we believe he may be a bit childish. Do you think the same? He was, he was absolutely impractical. Money meant, meant nothing to him. At one moment, he had a lot of money. You know, it was a different money in America in the 19th century. The hotel was 10 cents. A steak in a restaurant was 10 cents. So back then, $200,000 was an enormous money. Money One mil was really an enormous money. But he was always investing all of that in the, f of, uh, in the new research. It is interesting, you know, only in the Cold War, American government from roughly 1947 started funding the scientists very generously. And before that, it was always a private people like Astor, Rockefellers, and, 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 and the Vanderbilts, in, especially JP Morgan, were investing in that. And there was never enough money because he, he was not interested in completing the projects. He was interested in grasping the abstract idea. But since you mentioned this, uh, his morality was absolutely childish. He was thinking, you know, just like children do, you know, I, that you should be a good person and why should you be a bad person? And he was always talking about the well-being, about the entire humankind, uh, freeing people from the hard labor, freeing the weak from the oppression of the strong, all of these things that children, you know, like think about, but he was, all of his life, he was in moral terms a child, which is fantastic, but which also protect him much from the, from the dangers of the American uh, life in the, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Speaking about America, about the U.S., you have a common point. You moved from the same country to the U.S. For the U.S., Tesla is a turning point. Did, did he take a step towards the modern world with his inventions in the States? Thinking about the slavery time, think, thinking about the people working in the cotton fields, I believe he always also changed their fate. He contributed to the construction of the modern world with his inventions. But on the other hand, he was very unlucky in many things. And you are teaching, lecturing American history. I would like to ask about the States. What is going on in the States and what will happen in America? Oh my God, it's a complicated question. But uh, first to talk about Tesla, yes, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant myself. You can answer that in two parts, maybe. Maybe the first group is oh, about glad, Tesla. Glad I, can. I, with, with, um, I, I like the question because it is about what connects me with Tesla. You know, I, I came to this country and it is, not, it is not that common for a foreigner to teach national history. It would be hard to imagine, I don't know, a Frenchman teaching German history or a Romanian teaching Hungarian history, especially if there is some conflict. But in America, it was possible. They were always saying, okay, do you have a diploma? I said, yes, I have my PhD. Okay, teach it. You know, that, that's, that, was, that was that. And uh, uh, I learned uh, so much about American history, which really helped me to reconstruct the period. If a group of friends is sitting in 1898 in, the, in some uh, 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 restaurant in, in New York City, what are they going to talk about? To know that you have to know uh, history. And uh, we know exactly when you were asking me about modernity and introducing America into the modern world, we know exactly when that happened. It was the Chicago uh, Fair exhibition in 1893. And you know the, the famous Baum's novel, The Wizard from Oz. Baum as a young man visited Chicago and the magical land of Oz was Chicago Fair. And the Chicago Fair was lit by Tesla and Westinghouse. So actually, Tesla was the wizard from Oz. I'm not even making this up. I'm not even joking. It was like that. And it was kind of a pearl gate through which America entered modernity. 
Before that, America thought about itself more like a Jeffersonian country, the country of farmers, and they were a little bit afraid of modernity. But now with this eternal day, with all of these inventions, and Tesla investing house pavilion, uh, uh, that with, with the neon, that was, uh, which was wirelessly lit back then, it was that, that in, uh, rite of passage of America into the modern age, and that wizard was, was Tesla, backed by Westinghouse. And uh, again, talking about his morality, it was always about freeing humanity from the bestial labor, from the hard physical labor, hoping that people would like to learn and to dedicate themselves to the, to the inventions. You mentioned that Tesla was unlucky in many things, but he was in some ways very happy man. He used to I mean, you know, he didn't have family. He was not surrounded by people who, who, who loved him, the close circle, except friends. But he said that he spent decades in the bliss of invention. That is as close to, to God as the human being could, could come. And now talking about America as it, is, as it is right now, you know, I have to acknowledge that I was surprised with both things. I was surprised when Obama was elected president. I liked that, I wished that, but I didn't expect it. And then I was surprised again when Trump was elected president because I also did not uh, expect that. And apparently there is some subconscious message because you know all the prejudices that people have, they are not formed consciously. Very rarely people come to their children and say, go, go in the world and hate. Very few people are like that. But let's say uh, somebody moves in your neighborhood and these people are Puerto Rican. And the child comes to, to their mother and says, hey, we have a Puerto Rican neighbors. And if the mother just say, oh, from that oh, you can form a lifetime prejudice. And there is a certain unconscious permission to indulge your prejudices that I think have been, has been going on for the last two and a half years. And we have a lot of this uh, police brutality, and these are, now I'm talking as a historian, these are maybe the biggest race riots in the history of America, including 1968. And it is coupled with the pandemics, with the COVID-19. I was just reading that the numbers in Turkey, and by the way, in Serbia as well, they're going up uh, again, and that's really an unnatural situation. So you have a little bit of a cataclysmical feeling with these demonstrations and plus the pandemics, and that might continue in the fall, and we will see. Let's not pretend that, we, at least I'm not going to pretend that I'm smarter than I am, and that I can predict it. But it is an interesting time, and we will see how it continues in the fall. Interesting times. Can you talk about those interesting times? You are a novelist and you are lecturing U.S. history in the university. You have students and at the same time you immigrated from Europe. You can do some prediction, I guess. You this prediction uh, is a so-called prediction. You might have ideas about the future. What will happen? Will the riots even grow bigger? What is your idea? What is your prediction for the future? It is not just about the, the race riots. It is also about the pandemics. And people are asking themselves, are we going to live in a better or the worse world after that? There are reasons for both. In the worse world, because you will have even more control, really kind of like 1984, because you are following the people. And now with good reason, but in the future we will see. And the other one is that uh, we, we might get some ecological ma messages and we might actually do something about changing the society. About this, I'm a little bit of a pessimist. Not, not total control, I'm not paranoid in that way, but I, I think that the social differentiation in America, which is one in the, in, in the, of the biggest in the history of the country, will, will continue, that's what I think. About the race riots, I, I would be cautiously optimistic. I think that they might really lead to, to a greater control of the police. And uh, a number of very articulate black people, 
not necessarily politicians, more kind of like ordinary people, were talking really sense about this. And about this race uh, relations, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think that some gains in terms of, of equality might be, might be gained. And in the near past, I have read a novel coming from America, Nickel Boys from Parcel Whitington. It is telling about the end of 50s. You might have heard about it. There was also something about uh, riots, of racist riots. I don't think it will be as big as about the 50s. But this, if, how back can the American history go? It will not go back to the Nickel Boys, I guess. I hope. A black, but they have elected a black president, and despite that fact, we can still see how things got out of control. But we are talking about human rights. Don't the people have human rights? Didn't they settle these rights? How did this explode? How did this happen? The nickel kids, nickel boys was so long ago. What happened? Uh, the, when we talk about the riots, it is not a new phenomenon. It was happening in the 1920s in, in Harlem, for example. Something would happen, something bad like this. And somebody said that uh, racist killings are not new, they're just being televised. It is not the idea that it is now more than before, now it's just more obvious. And in the 1920s, for example, if you, uh, if you read Ralph Ellison, The Invisible Man, I call him Black Thomas Mann, a great writer, a great writer who writes about ideas. And if you want to understand about the roots of this, read Ralph Ellison. He wrote only two novels and some essays. One was uh, an enormous success back then. So Bellow wrote him a, a foreword and he respected him greatly. And the other one was Juneteenth. Juneteenth was the day of the liberation. And it is kind of prophetic because right now they are talking about establishing the Juneteenth as the national holiday in America. So Ralph Ellison was right on the money back then. And um, so you would have people, let's say in Harlem, in some black community, who would burn the entire neighborhood in which they live. And you can ask, how could somebody burn their own houses and businesses that are around? And basically, nothing, of, of, of nothing belonged to these Afro-American people. And that desperate rebellion actually was showing that they are living a leased life. Everything was borrowed. And from the moment they were brought here, you know, like they never actually owned their own destiny and the material things about them. And they would say, let it burn because it's not ours anymore. It is not like that right now, but it is kind of showing the roots of this, of this, uh, uh, of, of, of these happenings. And right now, people are bringing so many, in, uh, uh, so a number of injustices of the, of the past. And people remember the incidents in Oklahoma, in which a prosperous uh, Afro-American city was basically bombed. And all of these lynchings that were kind of put under the carpet of history, that carpet has been lifted and much of that is being seen right now. So, and I think that both anger and articulation, we can almost see these, uh, these protests as two separate ones. Riots is, although it is, hard to totally separate them. Riots are one part and the peaceful articulate process are another part. I really believe that the uh, accumulation of that is going to lead to some reforms, especially since the policemen in many places, and I hope eventually in all the places, are going to wear cameras. So it is not going to be a matter of interpretation. Coming back to literature, I believe that everything, the solution for everything is in literature. In a criticism about your book, it was, uh, your book was compared with two books. 
one with Günther Grass with a tin trumpet, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Loneliness. And it was uh, compared, as I said, with those books. It is uh, surreal, and you are creating a reality with your words, and it is based on a fact. You are also a law person, if I'm not wrong, and you're not trying to you, We can imagine what you have written, but I am an author, I am imagining, but on one hand, you are confronted with the facts and with fiction. How can you fill your head with fiction, with dreams, with imaginations? You are, as I said, lecturing in the university. You are in a reality. But when you're sitting back <laughs> at your desk, if you come to be compared with Gintagras Tin Trumpet, you are writing a novel. How did that happen? This. It's. Uh... I, I was always, because yes, I'm a historian, but I was always uh, uh, seeing history as a treasury of metaphors, because metaphors are really what works. And I, Tesla was interested in the invisible, and that's magnetism and, and electricity, and they are invisible powers. So I think that he saw electricity as the uh, clean essence of the dirty world. And I think that the great poet Rumi would have understood Tesla because that is that obsession with the invisible, which is the real mover of the, uh, of, of the world. Of course, we all live in the material world. And I think that dreaming and imagination and intuitions come natural to me. It was only what I really have to do is to discipline that to fit the realities of the world. So on, one, on, on, on the one hand, I wanted to uh, tell the story in such a way that everybody would understand it because there was much uh, unnecessary complications in, in telling uh, and mystifications in telling Tesla's story. Tesla's story is so unusual in itself that you don't have to make it any more unusual. You should actually just tell it as it is. You know that he was an uh, uh, extraordinary scientist because he had, he had a number of his discoveries in the moment of flashes, the kind of a light vizier would fall on his eyes and he would have a vision. And only because he was also, and this is the, uh, is it possible to be a rational mystic? I think it is possible to be a rational mystic. I think it is ideal for the, for the creative person. And Tesla was one of these. Because he was a superb mathematician. And first he would have his flash, and then he would go through the mathematical formulas to actually show it and prove it. And that is that anchoring the in, intuitive, creative uh, realizations into, into facts. That's what, what I was trying. In fact, it is a very interesting life story. We are uh, not talking about a genius who is interested in science. Also, mysticism is included, and with mystic stories, uh, we can also talk about Freud and Jung. He also mentioned uh, their stories. It is very nice and interesting to listen to the, for example, Tesla has a little bird, a gull. He's talking to the birds. He is taking care of his bird. How do you stand to metaphysics? Do you like to listen to those stories or you have other frequencies like writing or about the parallel universe. Are there anything interesting we don't know about or we don't, we cannot prove? There is a, there is a story. I think that the word frequency is a very good one. Actually, when people establish frequencies, they understand each other. And I think that you uh, understand your characters also when you found the, the, the 
frequency somehow. I think it is one, and basically all the things kind of tremble on a certain frequency, everything that exists in the universe. And he certainly was very much uh, thinking like that, although he, he was hiding that a little bit. He comes from the family of priests. It was kind of almost like a Hasidic dynasty. You know, his uh, uh, mother's side, there was maybe 32 priests. He was also interested in Hinduism and Buddhism. He met Vivekananda. Vivekananda was the man who introduced Hinduism and Buddhism to America. And uh, it was much before the 1960s. You know, in the 1960s in California, you have many young people following the, the spirituality of the East. But the first man who actually introduced it to America was Vivekananda. Again, on that same book fair, uh, in Chicago in 1893 that I mentioned, there was the Festival of the World Religions, and he was a spectacular success. Mind you, according to the standards of that time, and even today time, Vivekananda was black, and his tolerance and his vast knowledge kind of swept everybody off their feet. And Tesla became a personal friend of his, and he was a lifelong, in a way, follower of Buddhism. But there is one element that is not mentioned, but I always kind of, you know, felt it like that. He thinks in many aspects like a Sufi mystic, especially that importance of light as an illumination and the kind of direct connection with the source of things. He was even asking himself whether we have individuality as human beings. He was thinking that from the center of the universe, you have some kind of pulsation from which all the ideas are coming. And they are like, they just come into our head and they ring like a tram in the station. And he was taking that seriously, that there is only one subjectivity in the world, that we are all kind of, how to say, we receive our individuality rather than create it. And he took it so seriously that he was thinking whether it is okay to take patents for the ideas, because ideas, strictly speaking, are not ours. That is one. That is one of his of his thoughts. Tesla, bugünün dünyasını. In today's world, Tesla dreamt in today's world. Yesterday, almost until the internet is a chain of inventions. He was beyond his time. A genius, really beyond his time. Nowadays, we have lots of stories from uh, the States and uh, based on Tesla, Elon Musk is a Tesla fan. His cars, sending the cars to the space and placing them uh, in the universe. I don't really like that idea, but inventions of Tesla are realized by people nowadays. We are living in a world Tesla dreamed of without connections, without cables or wireless, for example. What are your thoughts about the fact that we are living today the life Tesla dreamed of? What was the biggest breaking point in his life? You talked about that in your novel, but what would you like to change for him? What was his biggest mistake? Where did he go wrong? Where did he break down? This unhappy life, why did it end like it did? He, uh, if I have to answer that in one sentence, he broke the promise to J.P. Morgan at the time. J.P. Morgan was the greatest financial power in the world. In 1913, J.P. Morgan already died and his son was uh, leading the bank. They controlled 13% of the world capital. It's an enormous power. And uh, J.P. Morgan was asking Tesla whether he can basically broadcast. He was interested in the races of yachts. And he wanted to know in New York which yacht has won. And for that, you basically need radio. And he was asking Tesla whether he can do it. And Tesla said yes. And he had a better system than, than uh, Marconi. And he basically is an uh, inventor of the radio plus the robotics, plus the neon lights, plus the rank and, and so forth. And um, uh, Tesla is, if you read Encyclopedia Britannica, he's recognized as the theoretical founder of radio. 
but he was not just theoretical. There were uh, experiments in St. Louis much before Marconi that were recorded. It was not just experiment. And actually, the Supreme Court in France and the Supreme Court in New York State recognized Tesla as an inventor of radio. Tesla could have done what, uh, what he promised to J.P. Morgan. But being in a way megalomaniac and looking for one thing, and that's, that's kind of the fr a tragic flow like in, in Greek tragedy, hubris, you know, when you want to do everything in the same time. He was actually building that famous tower uh, uh, near, close to New York, in which he wanted also to find the solution to the most pressing problem of humankind, which is the wireless transmission of energy. So a radio was to him kind of small potatoes. I mean, radio to everybody would be the, the greatest thing in their life, as it was to Marconi. Marconi got a Nobel Prize for that. But he invented, invested all the money rather than just giving J.P. Morgan what he wanted. He wanted to find the wireless energy. Now imagine with wireless energy, we don't know whether if he, he could have done it or not. But if he could, we would not have a climate uh, change. We would not have a pollution. We would have a really a much more harmonious world. And he gambled on everything and he lost the support of J.P. Morgan. Mind you, at that time, the state was not financing the inventors. It was always the private capital. And the, the business venture that J.P. Morgan left, nobody would touch. So he did not lose, at that moment, financial backing of just J.P. Morgan, but so many other uh, investors almost in a Stalinistic fashion, would not touch Tesla after that because he kind of gambled to something greater than the invention of radio. J.P. Morgan got really angry and he lost the financial support. Uh, evet, gayet güzel açıkladınız. Çok teşekkürler. Yes, that was a very nice and good explanation. Thank you very much for that too. You will very much liked in Turkish and a new novel of yours will be published in the autumn. I like the name very much. I would like to also talk about that new novel. Your readers are excitedly waiting. It's a story started in 1980, started with Tito. What did you tell in this novel? The novel is called Millennium in Belgrade. Can you tell us something about that book too? I would, I would gladly. Actually, uh, we, we have the same uh, publisher in Serbia, so your book is supposed, uh, scheduled to be published in a month. And I would really like to be your host as you are mine in Belgrade or in Novi Sad when that happens. I was just talking to Nenad and he's very enthusiastic about that. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the book about millennium in Belgrade, you know, millennium, the idea of millennium is the end of time. Uh, typically, it was the year 1000. Now, listen, we have more than one beginning of time. It, it, it could be from Hijra, it could be from the, from the uh, birth of Jesus Christ, it could be from the French Revolution. There were many counting of times. The ancient Egyptians had a different, and the Mayans different. Let's take the common calendar. That's how it's called. And the, the common era, if it starts in a year of zero, and you see how everything in history is kind of arbitrary. There are beginnings before the beginnings. So when it came the year 1000 in, in, the, in, in the Christian tradition, it should be kind of the second coming, and it should be the end of time. It's, uh, 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 and then uh, the kingdom of God is going to come. So the conventional time, human time is going to stop and some kind of whatever, a different reality, otherworldly reality would come. And in the year of 1000, many people in, in Europe, it was a deeply religious society, sold or gave everything that they had, expecting the end of time. And they dressed in the white robes and stood at the tops of the mountains, and they were waiting for the, for the star to come and the third of waters to become blood and so forth, and nothing happened. 
and in the morning they they return to their to their cities and towns in which they didn't have anything anymore because they gave everything expecting the end of the time so it was the year was 2000 when i when i when i finished my novel about um, uh, millennium in belgrade and it was also kind of the expected end of time and on the time square you would have the clocks counting the days and the minutes but nobody took it really seriously but there was actually one place in the world when it was the end of the of, of time it was belgrade because the nato bombing was happening exactly at that time so millennium means the end of time millennium in belgrade and it starts from the end of the Tito era until 2000. And it follows, and actually it is only one part of the novel. It is the story about my generation following, following three or four wars that kind of destroyed the world as we knew it. It was kind of really the end of the world. That's why Millennium is an apt uh, title. And Mircea Eliade had a, had a story about uh, one tribe that had their pillar of the world. Pillar of the world was kind of a totem that they were thinking was actually supporting the sky. And when somebody would destroy the pillar of the world, all the members of the tribe would just lay down and die because they felt so connected to that, to that idea. And this is the story about kind of the falling of the pillars of the, of, of the world. And um, so it, it ends uh, uh, with one, one of the reasons I went to America was Milosevic, you know, I was, I was not happy with that situation. And um, the book was actually finished while he was still in power, but it was published after his fall, so it was a little bit of the, the anticlimax. It, had a, it would have had a different meaning if it was before, but actually it is what I told you is on the surface the most political and most visible part of that. But I'm talking actually about more than that. I'm talking about the generation of the father of my main character, who was uh, a famous painter in Paris, like uh, Veličković or some of other Serbian painters who were really doing some kind of informal or I don't know how to call it. And uh, the, his grandfather is a Belgrade surrealist. So we are talking about the three generations of uh, creators, but there was always a volcano of history exploding between them. And never one generation continued what the previous one was doing because it was covered with lava of history like Pompeii. And uh, the, the final level, is a story about Belgrade, maybe the main character of the book is Belgrade, a collective entity, psychological. Cities are always living beings. You go to one city and you feel its atmosphere, which is different than the others. And it is the story about kind of a quintessential Balkan city with its very complicated and exciting history. So these are the elements of, of, of that novel, Millennium. Very interesting story. Do you know my roots are also in the uh, Balkans? My family was Albanian. They came to Istanbul in 1894, and I wrote their novel in my book. I told their story. We all uh, are coming from uh, similar cultures. We are distributed all over the world from similar roots and cultures and this is very inspiring this is very interesting and can i ask you on what you are working right now what is interesting for you right now i'm working on a number of different projects and i'm i'm glad that you mentioned that these similarities are very inspiring and um, i my my uh, parents were diplomats in Turkey from 1978 to 1982. And that's like how I came to, to know the country and love it. I speak very, very, very little Turkish, don't try me. But uh, uh, because, but I traveled a lot. I traveled uh, uh, in, in many places and then I was, uh, uh, I was in Istanbul then two years ago. And it was always interesting. One of the things that kind of connects us is that way. There is, my family is from Mostar. 
you know, and uh, that is in Herzegovina. And one of the most beautiful bridges, Ottoman bridge, one of the most beautiful in the world is in Mostar. This is not just my idea. Okay, I'm partial, I am. But it is not just my idea because if you see the pictures of the most beautiful bridges of the world, many times Mostar bridge is one of them. So uh, it was uh, built by Mimar Khairuddin, who allegedly was the disciple of the great Sinan, you know. And we know about Sinan, of course, but we, we know precious little about Khairuddin. I read that he was a Persian, and um, I, I read every Chalebi about the bridge, but that's kind of later. And I really uh, was uh, talking with a, with a Turkish professor from, um, from Harvard to try to find in the Ottoman archives uh, more facts about Khairuddin, and to, I, I always felt that I was deeply connected with that bridge. You know, I think that in a way your individuality is not just within you, your individuality is outside of you in the things that you identify with and that you recognize as the part of you. And plus that is a family tradition. And they really wanted to, to write about that. So I'm thinking, listen, if I don't read, uh, if I don't find anything about Khairuddin, I have to reconstruct it. But I actually like to have the essential facts. So it is one of the projects that I'm following now. Very interesting. And 1978, you are in Istanbul. I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> Istanbul nice. and Ankara. Istanbul and Ankara. There is one place I haven't seen and I want to see it, which is Nemrut Dai. I never saw Nemrut Dai. That's my ambition. In that case, Vladimir, when you are in Turkey, we should climb to Nemrut together. Is that okay with you? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> uh, right now, ITAF is broadcasted on a digital platform, but in the autumn we will have a real festival, we will be on the street. And Vladimir, you were scheduled to be in Istanbul with us this week and we were planning to have a dinner at the Bosphorus, but in autumn we can do that at um, Nemrut. Vladimir, we have questions. I have to interrupt. I have to ask you, in fact. I was asked about the same question when I read the book. Tesla's brother, some say uh, he died, uh, he fell from the stairs or he died because he fell from a horse. In your book, you say he fell down the stairs, but some people say he died because he fell from a horse. Did you hear that? Yes. It's actually more, I'm glad, very glad, uh, Nervin, I'm glad that you asked me that. And thank you for Nemru Dai, by the way. Uh, the, the, the legend is even more complicated and it has some bearing with, it, it, it has some connection with Turkey. And the, the horse was the favorite horse of his father. And it was given to him by a Turkish bag who lived by, uh, at that moment, what is today's Bosnia, is Turkey. And uh, there was a, Turkish nobleman who was a friend of uh, Tesla's father. And he did him a favor and he gave, gave him that splendid horse. It was an Arabian horse. And that horse was both a great blessing and a curse because it was a magnificent animal. And uh, it saved Tesla's father's Milutin life because he was riding through the blizzard and the wolves were following him. And that horse, because it was fantastically fast, like a fairy tale, he actually brought him home, uh, saving him from the, from the wolves. But it was the same horse, allegedly, that killed, according to one story, Tesla's brother Dane, by kicking him. Not, uh, he didn't fall from, it, uh, from the horse, but it allegedly kicked him. But that was one of my problems writing about Tesla. Many times you have two versions of the same event in various, uh, not somebody else writing about Tesla, but Tesla writing himself about himself. And I want to remind you of, of one thing, when Tesla's mother died, that was the human being that he was the most connected emotionally. And he lost his memory totally. His memory totally blanked at that moment. It was like an empty computer. So everything that he kind of remembered of his life about his life 
was later recollections of the lost memories. And maybe that is the reason why we sometimes have two versions of the same event, like that one about the, the death of a brother. This was one of the questions, especially about his mother. We can observe also in the book that she was a very strong character, that she was directing, in fact, his life. But did his mother form his future or more his father? Um, I think his mother. I, maybe, maybe he was a little bit unjust toward his father. He was father. His father was a priest, and many many people think since he was a, a priest, he was not. Uh, inclined to science. That is not always like that. He was actually a very good mathematician and he was thinking about becoming either an officer mathematician or uh, a priest. So he was, all of his life, he was also a great reader. He had that great memory like Tesla. You know that Tesla could memorize by heart and would just you know, like, but he could continue from any place within the book. That memory probably comes from his father. But the ability to invent the things that didn't exist before. And they always say if you are an inventor, the most exciting thing is you are the first human being that sees some of the things that nobody saw before. It is like Columbus, except that it is not the land, it is the, the idea, that is the concept. He got that from his mother and he was very connected. He was uh, very, I could say that, I don't know whether it is the word that we could use back, back then, but he was an early feminist. Because of that connection with his mother, he was believing that the future belongs to, to women and he wrote about that. <laughs> But he did not take women very much into his life. <laughs> that is true. But, um, you know, about his sexuality, that is a complicated question. And I think that he was, mind you, he was interested in Hinduism and uh, Buddhism. And if you believe in, in that, you have these chakras in your body. And the energy is moving from the chakra in your hips to where your head. And when it comes to your head, you de dedicate your life entirely to spirituality. At least that is the official version uh, that, that Tesla gave us. <laughs> Using all of your energies to create it. Okay. I also wonder... Shebnam also mentioned on your book, Tesla novel sold big numbers in Turkey, we have thousands and thousands of readers. After the new book is published, and also Mostar is for me a very interesting uh, subject. My roots and my husband's roots are in the Balkans, and everything we can read about that gets us very excited. If do you have any worries that that book might be less interesting for the people? I really don't know. I could. I was so glad once, uh, uh, dear Nermin, you, you told my Serbian publisher, I sold more copies than, of Tesla than you. That's kind of true. That's kind of true. And I'm very, very glad about, about that. But you could not predict. That interest in the, in the Balkan history, might uh, connect Turkish readers with Millennium in Belgrade. This uh, book about Kairudin and Mostar Bridge is still a book in progress, but I think that in the Balkans, we really see the others as the other version of ourselves, you know, kind of seeing from the other side, the stories that you kind of know, but not really in that shape. And that is really so exciting. I also feel the same when I, when I read about the Balkans. And uh, I don't think that, that Balkan people know enough about each other and what we all doing, building cultural bridges. I was just talking about the bridge in Mostar is the part of kind of changing that. Very nice. I walked on this bridge with my father. On one part, uh, we went from one part to another. We were three people, my husband, my father, and I. We did not talk at all while we were crossing the bridge. 
It was very interesting when we were on the other side, we had uh, counted our steps. It is not uh, very obvious, the steps aren't very obvious, but we had counted and we all three said at the same time 93 steps. This is also a very special memory. I'm very excited. I'm waiting for your book. Thank you so much, Nerm. <laughs> evet, belki de daha sonrasında e, Şebnem, e, Maybe later, Şebnem, you and I, we can meet at Mostar for dinner. What do you think? That would be that would be splendid. There evet. is a beautiful dervish tekia no, uh, close to Mostar on the river Buna. It's a, it's a place of power. You should also visit that. Ee, ben e, seninle kimin e, bu sohbeti yapacağını düşünürken When I was thinking about who could do this conversation, this interview with you because uh, I know uh, how interested Şebnem is in Tesla in your book and you have the same publishers Agora Publishings will publish Şebnem's book in Serbian and this is also a very nice coincidence, I did not plan that only Tesla was of uh, initiation. Thank you very much. Do you want to ask any other questions, Shebnem? I would like to thank you, Vladimir Pistola, and also Kalem Agency for organizing this broadcast, and also the translator. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, Tam Pınar, the author, we commemorized again. We should think about him and think of him. He gave us very nice novels and pieces of arts. And I'm so happy that we have a festival in his name in Istanbul. Again, a coincidence. The first book he sold to Serbia was one of Tam Pınar's books, Adjusting the Clocks and we opened the festival in Serbia with that book. I got some promises from you, dinner in Mostar, in Nemrod, and you will be in Istanbul in the autumn. Do you want me to promise something for you? Can I do something for you? Oh, something simple, a good Iskender kebab in, in some, in some <laughs> local place. <laughs> very nice, thank you very much. And your readers will uh, eat Iskander and think about you. Thank you. Bye bye. Best regards to the Balkan. Bye -bye.